is yeah, short codes versus widgets, which one and how. My name is Amanda Giles. You can follow me on Twitter at Amanda Giles NH. Uh, if nothing else, you can just get the link to these slides um, as well as the files that we'll be looking at. Okay, so here's
way to take input and criteria from WordPress user and convert that into output. But in this case, the shortcode is usually typed manually into the post tiny MC editor. It can be typed into a widget if you have that enabled in your, in your site. And sometimes you even get a, a button which will write the shortcode for you. So like if you've ever used the gallery feature of WordPress, if you notice behind the scenes, what it's actually doing, even though you have a nice UI, is it's writing a shortcode for you for the WordPress gallery. With a shortcode, we collect the input from the user via attributes within the shortcode, and we'll talk a little more about those shortly. And then, when, again, when the website is viewed, the content is displayed to the website visitor. So if you look over this, you'll notice that the only part I really changed in this is this middle part about how the input is collected and what the user interface is. Otherwise, the function of it is still the same. We're still collecting data in from a user, and we're returning that out to the website visitor in the form of the content that they see on the website. So just a quick example of a short code. Um, this is just in a regular post editor, so you can see here, is this working? No. Um, you can see in the blue is the beginning of the short tag, then I have some content in the middle at the end of the short tag, the short code, excuse me. Um, and then I've got a second one that has actually some attributes, and we'll talk again a little more about those in a minute. You can also put them in a widget, so this is just a text widget that you have the short code on. Again, to note, you do have to have this turned on in your theme. It sometimes isn't by default, but it's just a one line of code. So a little bit about the short code structure. Because we don't have the form the way we do with the widget, um, it's a little more free form. There are a few different ways that you can do the short code, and it all depends on how it was written um, by the developer who wrote it. So on the first example, you can see it's just a simple um, start tag, whatever the content is, and your end tag. Another way to do it is um, to have actually just a single tag without close and to put the data, the, the input in through attributes. So you have a format of attribute equals value, and you can have as many of those as you want. Um, so you have attribute value pairs with your value always in quotes. And then you can actually combine the two and have an opening tag with as many attributes and some content and your end tag. So you can't necessarily use all three of these with every short code. It all depends on how the developer wrote the short code, what it's expecting, what the developer is expecting for the input. So why would you want to create your own short codes and widgets when there are so many out there? This is honestly why I started. <laughs> because while I love clients and I couldn't work without clients, to have my phone ringing for every little change, um, it's just, it's not my favorite thing. My, my uh, goal in creating short codes and widgets is to give the user what they need so that they can, I can empower them to have their data the way they want it. Um, so, more seriously though, widgets and short codes are a way to control the content and or the presentation. Some do one or the other, some do both. While giving your user choices about that content, the location, or presentation, or all three. So every short code is a little, I mean every widget or short code is a little different, but these are kind of the general things that you can affect with them. And they're great tools to give your user, to give them the power. In my opinion, a good widget or short code for a user really needs to anticipate what the choices and variations are that the user might want. I'm not sure why the column short code person didn't think that 5.6 was going to be needed when every other iteration was. Um, it seemed to just be an oversight. Um, so anticipating what the choices that a user might want. And for developers, when you're writing the short code, um, I think it's also extremely valuable to offer ways to adjust the output on the other side. So just a little bit about how that can manifest is offering choices about web, how to filter the content, <coughs> offering choices about maybe what part of the content are shown, so if you've ever used like a show post widget, you might see an option that says, do you want to see the thumbnail? Do you not want to see the thumbnail? How many characters are the, you know, how many words in the excerpt do you want to see? These are kind of choices that you can give a user. Um, offering style choices. Now I'm not insisting that you have all of these things. These are just things that you might offer, things to think about when you're creating one. Um, I'm a fan of providing just very basic clean styling or even no styling at all. Just using the regular tags, 
and not trying to add something that's going to conflict with the user's site. But on that same note, be sure to, you want to be sure to tag your elements with IDs and classes that are unique so that developers or clients or savvy in CSS can, do, can actually add their own styling easily. You don't want a bunch of ambiguous elements that, that nobody can identify clearly. And then on the other side, using hooks to allow filtering for the developers. So this is in the code, and we don't have time, unfortunately, in this short session to go too deep. But what I mean by this is adding spots where you're um, putting in a hook so that a developer on the other side, if they want to take your output and maybe change it on the fly for a certain page, maybe on the home page, they want to hide the image, um, just by putting the hooks in your code, you don't have to do anything with them. But anywhere where you think a developer might want a different choice, might be too complicated for a user, or you didn't include it on the front end for some reason, um, it's a way to, um, it's just a way to make it more flexible. It's a way to make a developer not have to hack your widget or short code to get what they want. If you take the pieces that you think are safe to adjust and put hooks in there, then developers who use your plugins will be very happy with you. So obviously we've discussed a little bit about the differences between widgets and short codes, and what I wanted to do is just kind of go over uh, in summary some of the uh, ooh, that's really small, some of the uh, pros and cons. So widgets, as we've talked about, are drag and drop. They have a very easy and intuitive UI, um, and the nice thing is that they can include descriptive text. So right in the widget admin, you see a name, you see a description. On the form, you can have descriptions about what those fields are. They make it very easy to use. Short codes, on the other hand, not so intuitive to use. Um, if you make typos, if you type the attribute wrong, if you forget an end quote, you know, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong there. And with short codes, unless the developer has also built in a UI as a, a button in the tiny MCE editor, there's no visible guidance. So it's up to the user to know what the attribute names are, what to use as an attribute or content, and um, you've hopefully provided some documentation, but it's not necessarily right in front of them. Widgets, the downside of one of them, of course, is that you can only put them in designated widget areas. So your widget areas are defined by your theme, or if you're a developer, you might add your theme, and those are the only place you can put your widgets. So you can't just put them in the middle of a post, you have to have a designated widget area. Um, one of my pet peeves is that you can't copy them. <laughs> so if you have to do multiple sidebars, you have to recreate them and change the settings and um, by default. And a widget inherently is just more coding. Uh, for the pros that are on short codes, you can put them in any content area. So anywhere in the middle of your post, top of your post. You can also put them in widget areas, again, if that's been enabled for your theme, which is literally a one, one line of code to do that. You can easily copy them because they're just text. Copy paste them. You can put them right in your documentation. Say here are some examples. Um, so they're and they're far far less, much less coding because you have to do the same display logic, but you don't have to create the form. You don't have to save those values. So it's a much simpler um, simpler coding process. So the anatomy of a widget. And we're going to look at some code in a bit, but I just kind of want to give you guys a heads up. The anatomy of a widget is basically five pieces. The first four of these are all in a class designation, and they build on the WordPress widget class. The first thing is the declaration. We're going to tell WordPress, what is this widget? How do I identify it? What's the description to show in the UI? The second piece is we're going to create the form. So we're going to actually build the HTML form that the user sees in the widget area. The third piece is that we're going to save whatever choices they make in that form. And then the fourth piece is the display piece, where we actually turn the choices that they've made that we've saved into the actual output that a website visitor will see. And then the fifth most important thing is that we need to actually register that widget. So the first four steps create the widget. The fifth one tells WordPress, oh yeah, go ahead and stick my widget in the appearance, um, appearance widget area. And if you're having trouble with your widget, you can just uncomment out that one line while you keep working on it, and it will disappear. So just a little bit on what the code looks like. This is uh, just empty functions, just to give you an idea of it. This beginning part, like I said, is the class. So you have class, in this case, show post widget, extending WP widget. 
And then we have the four pieces that I talked about. So we have the construct, we have the form, we have the update, and we have the widget. And when I code one of these, this is the order I go. And I just kind of go in the logical order from where it starts to where I finish. Down here, we close the bracket for the class. Now, these aren't the only constructs, these aren't the only functions we can have in a class, but these are the four that you need to make the widget work. You can add additional classes that help the functionality of your widget, code that you're going to reuse to clear up your code, but you, you absolutely need these four. And then the last bit on the bottom here is where we're going to register and load the widget. And you can see right down here, we're calling widgets init. We're calling the name of our widget, which in this case is load show post widget. And then we're registering the widget, and this name that we're registering matches our class name up here. So, on the code, let's look at some widget code. Are you guys doing questions so far? Put 
Um, this just has a description element. You can also put a class element in here, and that will be applied to your widget uh, when it shows up. So very straightforward. Other things that we could have in here, we could be enqueuing JavaScript files. We could be enqueuing admin styles. We could be setting up global variables. Um, anything that you need to do kind of globally in your widget, this would be a good place to do. So the next piece is the form. This is where we're going to create that HTML UI that the user sees in the appearance widget screen. I get passed in the instance, which is the saved data if they happen to have uh, already created this widget and they're putting it up and edit it. And right off the bat, what I'm going to do is just take the um, parts of that instance and set them to some global variables. And what I'm doing for each of them, not global variables, sorry, some local variables here for the title, the before, the email, the after. And each one of these, I'm just checking if it's already set. If it is, I'm going to grab that value. If it's not, it's probably the first time they're using the widget. And I'm going to set some default text. So you probably noticed when we opened the widget before, it already said, contact us. It had a dummy email address. Um, email us at, and then for more information on the other side. So again, this can be anything you decide would be the default data. It can be something to help your user. And then I go on to actually creating the form. So right up at the top here, I actually put a class in here. I could have used a class in the construct, I just put it here. Um, if you wanted to add admin styles so that your, maybe your notes to users show italicized or something, you emphasize things. Um, this just again gives an easy way, not only for you to tag this form, but for developers who might be building on your form, trying to make an admin easier for their users. This is just again kind of an accessibility thing. And then up at the top, just a paragraph, that text that we saw, and then I'm just creating the values one by one. Trying to get this and it's not on the line. Okay, so in this first section here, you can see, and this is pretty much the same for all of the fields, I'm creating a label for my field, and I'm using a function called getFieldID, and I'm using another function you can see a little further down in the input called getFieldName. These are functions from WordPress, and what they do is allow you to, um, they generate the field IDs and the names for you. So you don't need to, but you know that all of your elements are tagged appropriately. So I have my label, I have my input with my name and ID, in this case, it's just type text, but you could be creating a drop-down, you could be creating a checkbox, and then my value is going to be <coughs> the value that I set up above. So that's either the value the user already has saved, or it's the default value that I set up because it's the first time on the widget. So the next few fields are the same thing, but with the different fields. And then I'm ending my form. Obviously, the next thing after they use the form, I want to save those values in the system. So I'm creating a function called update, again, still within the class. I get passed to the new instance and the old instance. So this is what the values were coming in, and now what the values are coming out again. And to start, I am just creating an object, a variable called instance, and I'm setting it to the old instance. And then what I'm doing is field by field, um, just creating, it's just going to be an array of all of the elements. I am checking if they're empty, and if, I'm sorry, if they're not empty. If they're not empty, I'm going to strip any tags out, because I don't want my user trying to do anything funky. And if they are uh, not, then I'm going to put a, um, just have a blank empty string there. And then, very important, I'm going to return that instance so that widget, I mean that WordPress, can then take that and save it to database. Yes, Um, for this instance, I'm just starting with the old ones, but honestly, when you develop it, it would be up to you. 
if they if they cleared it out. In my case, I'm just um, if it's not empty, then I'm just going to take the value. Um, this is probably goes without saying for those of you who've written widgets. This is a very simple stripped down widget. So there are definitely some other things I'd recommend, but we don't have all day. So um, okay. So the meat of it, the next part is our uh, widget itself. And the two things that we get in from the widget are the sidebar arguments and the, both, both arrays. We get an array of the sidebar arguments. So that's um, generated from the fields that you define when you do register sidebar. And we also get a copy of um, the widget values instance saved as well. And let me just show you very quickly what that looks like visually. So the sidebar arguments that come in, they come into an array like this. So if you've ever called register sidebar and create your widget area, you have set some of these fields up. And what it's done here is return those values um, with the substitutions for the name of the, of the widget area and such. And then the widget instance, in our case, is just very simple, but it's just the four elements. So that's just the visual representation of what that array comes in. So you have an idea of what we're looking at. So I'm extracting both of those, which is taking all of those values and putting them into a variable um, with that name, so I just don't have to do it piece by piece. And then, very simply, I'm checking if my email is not blank. If they didn't give me an email address, that's pretty much the whole point is to encrypt the email. Um, so if they don't give me an email address, I'm just not going to do anything. But assuming that they gave me an email address, I'm going to essentially combine the sidebar arguments with the saved choices from my widget. So this before widget actually comes from registering the sidebar. So if the theme developer has said, every time you have a sidebar, I want to have this class, above, this um, designation, but maybe they have a line above it or some other, you know, 20 bits of padding, whatever they've chosen. Um, you know, we want to honor that and carry that through. So we're going to echo that out. Um, it's one thing to know about widgets versus short codes. With widgets, you're always going to display the output out. You're going to echo it out. Um, even if you just collect it all in a variable and then echo it at the end, um, you always want to be echoing it out, otherwise it won't display. When we look at the short codes, what we do instead is we return the HTML data because that short code is processed on a, um, on a filter called do short code. So another little bit of a difference between the two. So in here we're just going to echo things out as we get them. So I'm echoing the before widget. I'm checking the title. If I have a title, I'm going to add the before title and the after title. Again, that we're just provided by the register sidebar. And then I'm going to put my text together. So I'm creating a variable called text. I'm having my before text and a space. Then I'm adding a string for the email address. And the whole reason that I'm doing this is so that I can use this function called anti-spambot. And what that'll do is encrypt it so that um, spam bots can't read it, but it will look perfectly fine on the website. It just uses the, uh, the uh, HTML entities. And I'm going to do that both to the mail to link, which I'm creating, and also to the actual display email. And then I'm going to append another space and add the after string. Now, because there might not be a before and after string, there might be, for instance, just dropping the email in there. When I put it all together, I'm going to put a paragraph tag around it, and I'm going to trim it in case there's a space before and afterwards. And then I'm going to echo after widget. So now I've, that's my own widget logic, very straightforward. This is the end of my class designation, so I've done those first four pieces. And then the next thing is that I'm going to register my widget on widgets in it. How are we doing out there? Okay. So let's just see this in action real quick. So make some changes to this. Thank you. 
go ahead and do that. Um, the anatomy of a short code, like I said, less coding, much simpler. Um, we're going to write the short code function. That's the function that's going to take those attributes and convert it into the output. So it's the equivalent of that widget function that we just looked at. And then we're going to, again, we're going to register the short code function so that WordPress recognizes it when our user uses it. Otherwise, the user will just, the visitor will still see the brackets. We'll probably all have that happen at some point. So, back to the code. So, further down the same file is the short code. So right off the bat here, we're actually um, adding this uh, mystical line that I keep talking about. Add filter widget text do short code. All that does is say when I put text into a widget, check if there's any short codes and process them. Um, otherwise, if you have those text widgets with short codes, they'll just appear with the brackets. So. And then the short code function, much shorter, not kidding about the less coding. Um, email and code function. I get a couple things here. This ATTS is an array of the attributes. So those attribute equals value tags, all of those I receive as an array. And then content, if, there's, if the short code is written in such a way that I'm expecting content, I get that as a second variable. And then all I'm doing here, like I said, I'm going to skip the before and after because with the short code, they can type the before and after themselves. There's no real need for me to do it. Um, this is actually a short code I put on a lot of my sites for my clients. Um, I just, it's one of those things that I just paste into every site here, how to email short code. And again, I'm doing the same code. I'm just creating the link with anti-spam <coughs> Um, note that I am returning the value, so in the widget we echo the value, in the short code we're going to return the value. Uh, if you do echo it, it's going to show up <laughs> somewhere not in the right place at all. Um, so if you see that happen, go back and check. And then the all-important add short code email, so this is, the, um, this is the short code text, not very original, and then the name of our function. So let's just go look at that real quick. This one I am just expecting the content. So I... So I'm just going to say... Put my own little text in before. I'm going to say email john at doe.com slash email. Update that. Go back over here and wait for that. So I have email at johnlepto.com. So let's make that just a little more complicated. I have another version here just so you can see. In this version, I am going to accept the email address as an attribute. Um, so address equals and my email address. And I'm also going to let them put a class name in. So if they want to tag that email address with a particular class, so they can style it. So this is email and code function 2. And I have it set down here as email 2. And what I'm doing in here is the first thing I'm doing is um, calling short code ATTS, which is going to take um, those, uh, those attributes. And if they were not supplied by the user, I'm going to put some defaults in here. So the email address, I'm not going to do anything if they don't give me email. Obviously, I don't know their address. Um, for class, I'm going to use a class of email. So if they don't tell me, I'm going to use a class of email. Otherwise, they can pass one in. And then the extract is just going to um, take those elements and put them into variables again. And then down at the, end, the next thing I'm going to do is just check the class. So if my class isn't blank, I'm going to come up, um, create a class string to stick in my link. And then I'm going to return, and pretty much the same thing as before with the addition of my class text. So which is either blank or it has my class name in there. Since I put a default in for class name, it's always going to have a class name. So. I suppose I really need to check that part. And add the short code. So let's just go look at that real quick. I have to remember my thing. So if I was a really crafty developer, I would have written a button here on the tiny MC editor, which would make it a lot easier to do this. Because you could write it for me, but we only have a little bit of time.
Good, good, paying attention. I did a session last week at 4 p.m., which is a rough time at the end of a word count. I think everybody's going to pull. You can see the two of these. This is with the, con with the special class that I put in. Contact me, and this is uh, with the default email class. So I give us a little different slide just so we can see. Okay, so we're going to start with this. So just I'm just going to put this up again as a little bit of review. So again, the widgets. Drag and drop, very easy. The short code's not as intuitive, no visual guidance. Our widgets, you can only put them in certain areas, they're a little more work. And our short codes are a lot more flexible, you can put them anywhere, um, easily copy them, very easily write them. And if we had time, we would do a short code plugin, but I want to save some time for questions. So. Questions? Was that good? You guys were so <laughs> um, Well, we have a minute then. Do you want to see a build your own short code plugin? <laughs> okay. So I haven't used a lot of these because I just tend to write my own, but I checked some out the other day and I'm going to show you one called Short Codes Pro. It's not the only one out there. It's an interesting one because it lets you write PHP code. So a lot of short code plugins either just come with set short codes this is one where you can build your own short codes. And, um, oops, I have to go to short codes first. So we're going to say add new short code. And I'll actually just call this, let's call this email free. And it's behavior, you can either wrap the content with something or you can insert custom code. So on this one, I'm going to say insert custom code. You can actually specify attributes if you want. I'm not going to bother with this one, but you can. And then down here, this is the part I thought was fascinating. So you can put something in HTML. So if you wanted to create a short code that's, say, the Facebook link, so that your client could everywhere they want put their Facebook link without having to remember to type it correctly or anything, you could do that. But in this case, we're actually going to we're actually going to put some PHP in there. Uh, it does guide you. You do need a return statement, and we're actually just going to take the same code that we wrote up here. I'll just give you a little guidance here. It says, oops, that's not So it did start you off with a return, and it does give you a thing at the bottom where it says use the variable content. Um, again, you can also use attributes, but uh, for this, we're just going to keep it straightforward. So we have the same PHP code in here, but we didn't have to create a plugin, we didn't have to add any code to the theme. And then this is the nicest thing it will create a button for you. So it says check to include a button. And it has a couple other things. Where do you want to click the button? What do you want to call it? So I'm going to call it encrypt email address. And then you load the button image as the featured image. So I have a little envelope here. Now if I go to my page to make that content, um, I see my shortcut button at the right here. I sent her one, so it's right at the top. And actually what I want to do here is just type my content. So John at Joe.com, and then if I highlight that and click my button, it will create it for me. So, um, so it has do action equals email three. Oh, so behind the scenes, it's written a short code for the word do. And what it's going to do is check what the next piece of what that action is, and it's going to look at the rules that I already set up. So if you're wanting to create short codes, but you don't want to go through all of that other thing, this is the way you can actually do that. So here is our code again. So we created a short code without actually being uh, in a plugin at all. That one is called Short Codes Pro. I'm not sure. I have I didn't get that far into it. I, I didn't really use these, but I thought it would be a good example for people who are coding. So, other questions? I'm I'm also going to be at the happiness bar from 10 to 11.
so feel free to come and find me. Yes. Okay, the question was, how do you prevent short codeine conflicts? Um, the previous question, sorry about that, was, um, does this actually run evals in the background to execute that PHP code? And the answer is, I don't know because I haven't used the plugin much, but you can look at it. Um, there isn't a good way that I know of. Um, make a very unique name. Uh, I was going to say namespace your code. It, namespace your code, okay, excellent answer. 